talk for 2016 or exhibition Art Craft Design. We are so thankful to have you all here in supporting the arts and our fellow artists here today. As some of you may know, at 108, our motto is Art Craft Design. So we've been really looking forward to having exhibition focused on the design process of many um, woodworkers and furniture makers alike. The board and staff for the past year have been talking about who we'd like to showcase in our space. And one of the first names that came up was James Hinkle. As some of you may know, James is one of the most prominent design professors in Oklahoma. He spent over 40 years teaching at OU in a plethora of design classes. And um, he's been very helpful throughout his time working with us, gathering his pieces, well, as well as his family. And unfortunately, he passed away right before Christmas time, so he wasn't able to see his pieces together. But his family has been so generous and so um, giving about his pieces to us. Um, so to speak on behalf of Hinkle is his friend Susan, who is a colleague as well as a friend, who I think can speak on behalf of him and his family. So thanks, guys. Susan? He said, my painting, sculpture, and designs are in the modernist tradition. In my studies for industrial design, there was an almost equal involvement in sculpture as the concerns of contemporary sculpture are reflected in functional design solutions. The manipulation of forms, balance, and spatial relationships are common to both disciplines. In recent years, I've concentrated on sculptural furniture. These are mostly one-of-a-kind pieces and are treated as art objects. I have chosen to work in wood because of its natural beauty and malleability. Well, I thought that was good to kind of talk about his intentions before we start out. Um, I will talk about his process, and I can tell you a little bit about his life. Maybe I should say where he was trained. He grew up in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, and was born in 1947 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And uh, he studied at the University of Nebraska as an undergraduate. He studied not only art, but also mathematics and engineering. And um, so he has a lot of mathematical kind of background. And uh, he went to Pratt Institute, and where, he, where he studied under Alexander Jusron Costello, who was called the father of industrial design education, and also with his wife, Rowena Reed and uh, with Robert Colley, and he spoke most highly of the influence of Eva Zeisel, who was a Hungarian-born industrial designer known for her ceramic designs, and her work is in museums all over the world. Uh, she uh, drew from natural forms, and so some of the curves and the natural qualities you find in his furniture may have derived from Eva Zeisel. Anyway, uh, I want to talk a little bit about his process. Here you see in balsa wood some replicas, actually they're models for works, you can see them over here, works that he made. And he would start out drawing on that table behind you, you can look at it more closely, that teak table. It opens up, he kept his papers and pencils in that, and he would sit and sketch to, to good music. He loved really fine music like Stravinsky and Shostakovich and things like that. And so he would do his sketching, and you can see sketches by him, and also by uh, down there, you know, and Mark Holly on these walls and on either side, which is really good because you see their process when it's looser, when it's an idea. And uh, then he would uh, work further, and he gave these little things, I think, to see how they would balance and how they would look. But he, when he made his furniture, we just look at these rockers here, he would uh, work them out, he would make actually cardboard pieces that were the very shape and size of the pieces, each piece, like the laminated pieces in the seats, for example, that he was going to make. So they became his life-size patterns, and he would cut the wood from there. And um, then um, he would obviously smooth it and everything. Things are made very, very well. Not only are these pieces laminated, but they're wooden dowels when we put together. So they're very, very strong. Uh, this rocking chair is a cherry. And um, it, it, I, I like the way from the rock at the bottom it comes straight up to support the arm. He uh, designed the back, the, the curved back, uh, according to the Ames, the famous Ames lounge chair, so that it's very, very comfortable. I'm sorry you can't sit in it. I'm sad in it, but <laughs> anyway. And notice here, this is an interesting way these spokes are fastened with dowels to a top piece. 
Now, this is maybe my favorite piece, and I, I was glad they chose it to, it, uh, to advertise this show. This is of African Padouk. This is a cherry. This is of African Padouk. And it has just such a gleaming quality. Not the market work with exotic woods. And by the way, when he worked with natural woods, he watched when somebody got cut down or a tree blew down, a big uh, elm tree or oak tree, or, and he would use the woods from around the area. Uh, but anyway, this is African Padouk. And um, it is, I think, marvelously designed. I think it's interesting from the rocker goes a sort of curved piece uh, uh, holding the rockers together in the back. And from there, clear from the floor up, come these separate pieces that are not joined, that are curved to be really comfortable. And the design, I think, is just really quite marvelous and like no one else's. Um, if you have any questions, just stop me. I'm just talking rather informally here. But, uh, that's a tea. The tea coffee table here is a tea. And you'll notice that when we had our show at the Fred Jones, uh, the tables, we, two of the pedestals remain, so we use them. But the tables of one of the designers of the exhibition, uh, well, preparators of the museum, uh, took his actual drawings, which are like engineering drawings, and made them smaller, and then drew over them very carefully so that you could actually see how the piece was made, the different pieces that went into it. So that one and this little table over here have those, those drawings uh, that were gems. And that helps you see the process, how you have to think of all the separate pieces and figure out how to put them all together. And I had these pieces like, okay, how can I use these? And, and uh, I had this piece of zebra wood laying around, some of these other these other pieces, and then this this piece of curly walnut. I used to work with a, uh, uh, a landscape company, and some of the guys were using that board as a as a ramp for their book. And so I I, I saw it. He was gray and all that. And it looked pretty nice, and after I took it home and cleaned it up, it's like, oh, this is great, you know. So, uh, so I had that, and so this was more of a just like a staging. I would take pieces and I sort of block them up and stage them up and say, you know, okay, this, this, and this, and uh, so this has walnut, and then uh, zirapati is on the ends of the walnut. Uh, Coco Bolo is on the ends of the zebra wood. And so like this this piece goes into the ends, you know, it's carved into the ends and fully go into the ends. And then this was a section, this piece was a section, and then I set up to carve out into this into this maple piece for so it all that all goes into that maple. And then the same on the other side, those pieces on the end. And then the piece on the side, all that whole unit is carved into the next unit. So, um, and I think, I think when people, you know, they look at, and I sand everything. I want the underside as fine and as refined as the as the top, bottoms, everything, uh, and also that these, you know, the woods are what you see is is the natural wood. There's no, I don't use stains or anything like that. It's just like a. I used a you know like a clear clear finish, uh, a Danish a Danish oil finish, and I like to feel I like to feel the wood, so that's you know I, I just like to be able to touch the wood and feel the wood and see it. Uh, so, uh, John, how many hours in this piece? Are you sure I yeah I, I'm not sure. I'm thinking maybe a couple hundred, but you know. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I kind of lose track of time when I, I get them. I, ne I never log my time. I should, but uh, it, it sort of think I might get really depressed if I start keeping track of time. But, but you have to sit around and just see something and you work a little bit. Some, yeah. Sometimes I go from one piece to the other. It just really depends on my space of how how I can get. You know, I don't want to get too strung out, but. Uh, but you know, I do. I spend a lot of time on the finished work and all that. But then, and then, when I think when people look at it, they think, well, you know, you spend all your time sanding. But it's actually, I spend probably more time with the fitting of one piece to another because they're because I want it to be sculptural. Each piece has its own shape and it has its own. There's no, you know, it's, there's no straight lines. There's no nothing square about it. There's nothing that you can just, you know, plunge a router or you know do something like that. So. 
So I have to, and I've developed ways that I can uh, keep track of what happens when I, so it's really a matter of, I, I carve out some, start fitting pieces together, I keep carving, and I keep fitting, and I might do it hundreds of times, or maybe, maybe a thousand times before it's actually, okay, this is it. You know, so I should really spend more time, and that's the that's part of the evolution. That's part of the sort of the give and take of, of like one piece into another. And I had had made a statement too that it's sort of like you know you have these different elements that are coming together to to serve a purpose. So uh, so then as there as as each piece is you know carving into one, I, and I thought, well, stop, I'm gonna start carving one into the next one, into the other one. So there, each each piece kind of gives up something to be, to join with the next piece. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like relationships. Uh, but, uh, so anyway, that one was, this one was around 1997. That, um, that cabinet back there, uh, is, is dated 1999, and so I had done, I'd actually started on a, a larger version of, you know, I did, I did a large cabinet that had, you know, I was kind of still into this, you know, doing the little, you know, the S miters for the doors, and I had started on this, you know, my, my third arm, my third part of the piece was this huge arm bar. And, and it was really, it, it got to be, it was too much for me. I, had, I thought, I don't know, I don't know enough, it was, things were going, and I had to just put it aside for, and I actually put it aside for years, uh, until I could, felt like I could come back to it. And I, and I, but I did come back to it, I got it finished for my show, you know, the, and like, well, okay, okay, it's, and that was in, I think I had a show in 1997, that was, Furniture and sculpture and stuff like that. So, uh, and I so I got it got it done, and I thought, well, I wanted to, I wanted to make a more of a a small a small cabinet that was just kind of a fun thing to do, and and uh, and I called this ascension, and it was and, and my my work is sort of inspired by landscape and nature and I think that's you know if I have you know some native influence it's it kind of comes through that way it's just connection to the earth and connection to materials and responding to the material that I have so there's sort of that um, I did some inlays of of uh, this is the vega here it's got maple and cherry purple heart cocoa boa <laughs> inlays of, of uh, ebony where I had had made, you know, they're about a quarter of an inch thick and I had recessed them down into the carved them down into the uh, bingo and then get that flatten that off, send that off and then I take Roy Bayo and make some pieces out of that and then carve into that and recess that in, into, the, into the ebony. So it makes this sort of it's sort of like these these things uh, dissipating up into the air, and, and then also sort of you know clouds and and, and like stars and skies and, and that kind of stuff there. But uh, and then I after I was I had gathered you know I was working on this show, and a lot of these pieces are from from uh, private collections that you know for the people that have bought pieces and that. And have been generous enough to loan them to me, and so I gathering these th things up and doing the, you know, sort of assessing, assessing my past and assessing where, you know, like uh, what I was doing and things that were going on and all that. And uh, so then I started thinking about, well, this this piece is titled Ascension, and then I have another chair that says it's titled Higher Places, and then another chair that's stairway and I seem to be this like what is that? So, so it's it's sort of I guess it's sort of a uh, I don't know so much gaining spirit spirituality but it's sort of like getting trying to improve you know improve upon myself.
I did have the luxury of having a nice wood shop as a young, young kid. My dad was an engineer, and his hobby was woodworking. So I always had this sort of nice, equipped you know, shop with all the tools in it, which was a huge plus. I didn't know at the time I was going to end up doing this for my entire career. Um, I went to college at, at OU when I graduated. I tried to find a job in Tulsa. I couldn't find a job, particularly in any kind of product design field. So I actually started making stuff in my garage. And then I was in Oklahoma City. And did my first commission was for the, the guy that owned Pepsi Cola distribution plant. I built a cabinet for me, wanted to hold TV and swivel. Some things I really didn't know anything about. Uh, he gave me a deposit, I finished the piece, he gave me the deposit, he said keep the deposit and keep the piece. So I said, it's in my garage. <laughs> Someday we'll unveil it. It's not horrible, it's just, you know, whatever. So I kept totally discouraged and, you know, quit, but I kept going. I was married, I had children, and I had an immense amount of pressure as far as trying to do this for a living. Um, my dad would come to me painfully, and years later, I was like 40, and he'd say, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> so, but I didn't let that stop me. I just was determined to do this. I had unfortunately read an article when I was 25 that if you're a furniture designer, you might become successful when you're approximately 60. 35 years have gone by, and I'm glad to say I am here now <laughs> at 60. You know, my big break, I get to go and do this show, and I thank you guys so much for that. <laughs> I have to do a lot of pieces for people that were just you know, commission pieces. We do a lot of custom pieces. We produce, I produce with my shop. I've got two other people, my son Reed and, and Randy Latham. We probably produce three or four pieces a week. Uh, we have to, to pay the workers' comp, the insurance, the banker, the, <laughs> the payroll, all that. So it was nice to be able to have at least 90 days to produce pieces. I had sketches for years and years. I've always wanted to make some of them were pop art pieces, like the pocket knife, the paintbrush, the, and the mesh boxes. And it's not exactly a furniture piece, but I just wanted to try to do some things that were a little bit different. Um, and here I am. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Christine, you have any questions? <laughs> Christine's my partner and she runs helps us with the other showroom at Utica at 7th Street. So we do, we have a lot of other things besides so just custom furniture pieces. Tell us about that catalog right there. Well, I always like the art that I can deck up style pieces. Uh, you know, it's fascinating how they have curved things and burled woods. And actually, some of the, all of our decorative furniture, there's so many designers like Ruhlman and guys have made awesome stuff and you look at stuff today and it's you know not curvy or not even this base molding is hard to do because you have to veneer the wood over the radius more which is about you know, popping off. So I've always liked Art Deco pieces. I've always liked burls. I did the Art Deco chair that started those probably 15 years ago in my head and sketches. I couldn't figure out how to make the arm strong enough and take the arm. So then we routed out all these pieces and laminated them together so the arms in one piece with no joints in it. And then we figured out how to tape it on an incline thing and a sander. We just literally had to walk it around the sander, sand a little bit of the bevel off, walk it around, sand a little bit more bevel <coughs> off so you can get the thing smaller at the back than it is at the front. So that, yeah, that's back, that's back to that. We can walk right there. The most time in the piece I did was probably the one with the drape.
Sox, the, the Memphis Design Group, and it was, it was an Italian group of guys who came together in the 1980s. They designed laminates, cabinets, bookcases, clocks, all kinds of stuff. You can still look it up. Some of their pieces are in the Museum of Modern Art. And they had a factory in Italy that would make um, particular laminates, kind of like the Michael Furniture. So this laminate was available, it's not anymore, as part of the Memphis Design Group. So I, I designed this piece to try to follow that flavor. Everything was kiltered and offset, and so I made this bookcase with the girls in it. With that. Well, go ahead, Bob, you have a question? I, I would like you to explain how you did that. There is this walnut, and I thought it was, when I first saw that, I thought, well, you got, it looks like it's chocolate. <laughs> yeah, it's four, yeah, it's four pieces. Of, four pieces of walnut that have been like finger joined together, um, and then I was always like trying to make something that was liquid, made it look more liquid, change the material that normally would be wood and rigid and straight, try something a little more flowing. So it was just a matter of carving on it, you know, a lot of carving, and then I did recess bowls inside the underneath walnut. Piece and then drill two holes in the marble so it's molded on. Okay. It's molded on from underneath to try to handle it. And given the illusion of lightness and a, some sort of armature that's holding it, and, um, it, it, it turned out it turned out fun. Oh yeah. Well, and how did the, tell us about that paintbrush over there? The paintbrush is a, we had a turn this post and glued up some poplar, turned the post out of maple. We had a little bitty lace, and we had to actually make an extension on our table to, to do it. This is kind of scary. Because it's only a three foot level jet lace, is what we had. And then we found it, uh, I got a chrome piece fabricated. It's a lot like an exhaust manifold from a car. And then the bristles were made out of a horse's tail, which is readily available. It doesn't hurt the horse. <laughs> <laughs> no, no horses were hurt. No. <laughs> steel rod that runs in, so they can actually just pull off of the paint on there, it pulls off, the, the hair is kind of hard and there's a metal rod that goes up the, up the top of the brush, about 10 inches. Um, but it's just, you know, pop art artists, I was always interested in some of the artists that were doing it, Oldenburg, or even some that Andy Warhol had been, taking an ordinary object and blowing it up, <coughs> and that's the pop art thing. So when you take something like a paper clip or a toothbrush or a paintbrush or a pocket knife and span on the sides, and it becomes bigger than life, has a huge base, and, and goes into the art category. <laughs> <laughs> Europe, we call it Macabarl. 
And then with this incline box, I was able to put it through a 36 inch wide belt sander and take this from taking off nothing to taking off a little bit more and just elevating, making the sander go a little bit higher, a little bit higher, a little higher. And then slowly walking around the machine and beveling off the side of his arm. So it used to be the same thickness as that. Wow. <laughs> and then this board, there's a board that's bent, laminated to the back that is forced into the, into the piece. And then the box is just is, is made of also multi bursts of plywood and then it's upholstered in leather. Chairs are tricky because like, even this chair, I've drawn it up, I've looked at it, messed with it, and it's going to sit a little bit deep for people. So it's one of those deals where you kind of have to go back to the drawing board and probably shorten this about an inch on the arm, maybe an inch and a quarter, and probably shorten the seat about an inch, an inch and a quarter. This is bolted in from the inside of the, of the box into this armature from the inside. But when you put all those layers together, it's just incredibly stout, and, and there's no joint to break. You know, there's not like there's a joint here, a wood, or a joint here, but it's all just cut out of one piece four times and just push it and glue together. So it gets like a laminated beam like that. Right, right. Beautiful.